So, chapter 13, Revelation. Things are about to get interesting. Not that they haven't been, but as we go through this, the rest of the book here, things are going to get very interesting. Father, we come before you and we settle our hearts and we ask that you would open your word to us this day. Thank you, Lord, that you have recorded these things as well as other sections of scripture. That your church would not be caught unaware. That we might discern the signs of the times. And Lord, we would be wise in this generation. We pray you'd open your word to us today. May we understand you more. May we know how to pray for our nation and the nations around us. And Lord, we ask that we would be strengthened. May our hope be stirred, Lord, as we see these things coming to pass. May we rather than be fearful, may we find ourselves more and more bold to warn people to get ready because Jesus is coming. Thank you for this time, Lord. Strengthen your church through your word, we pray. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Revelation chapter 13, and we have been through, well, about half of it last week. And what we were looking at last week is we went through basically the idea that the, the, the Antichrist is not a new concept as we get into the book of Revelation and or John speaking it to us in 90 AD. The Antichrist, as we went back and took a look, has been something that God has been warning the world about for 2,600 years. And it started with Daniel, and of course it was Nebuchadnezzar's dream. He saw the statue, the gold, the silver, the bronze, the, the iron, and then the iron and clay. And he was basically informed, Nebuchadnezzar, that there'd be four major world empires. Babylon, then Medo-Persia, then Greece, and then Rome, and Rome dividing into two legs that would be east and west, and eventually reforming in some way in these ten toes that were iron and clay, partly strong, partly weak. And what Nebuchadnezzar received is that in the days of those ten co-reigning kings, there would be a rock cut without human hands. God would establish a kingdom that would have no end, and it would impact those governments and take them over and defeat them. And God would then establish a kingdom that would have no end. And of course, Daniel, interpreting these things to Nebuchadnezzar, was very curious about it. He was, he was praying and seeking the Lord about it. And in chapter 7, God gave him the next vision that showed him, again, these four different kingdoms, but to find them as beasts. And so we saw the lion, that was Babylon. We saw the bear, that was Medo-Persia. We saw the leopard with four wings moving very swiftly that had four heads which was Alexander the Great's empire that was divided among four of his generals. And then again, we saw this fourth beast, really not described as, as any animal, just a beast. And it had 10 horns and it had teeth of iron and nails of brass. And, and these, these are teeth of brass, this just sort of overwhelming beast that is shown. And as he's looking at the head and those 10 horns, which relate, of course, to the 10 toes of Nebuchadnezzar's statue, another little horn rises up among them, deposes three of them, and then begins to speak blasphemous words against the God of gods. And the angel that was there explained to Daniel that these 10 horns are 10 kings that shall arise. And this is important for us today. 10 kings that shall arise, and another king will rise after them. That's essential after them and will depose three and then will begin to blaspheme the God of gods and expand his power. So Daniel learns these things again in chapter seven, chapter nine. He's shown what happens to Israel. The Messiah will come in 926 on a specific time. He'll be cut off, not for himself. The city will be destroyed. And then we learn in Daniel 927 that there's a coming false prince who sets up a peace agreement, as you probably know by now, for how long? None of you know this. Oh, bad. Seven years, and in the middle of that agreement, he will break that agreement and cut off the offering and sacrifice. So Daniel, again, learning these things, sought after God, and in chapter 11, he's told again of this individual that he would rise up, he would blaspheme the God of gods, he would honor a God of fortresses in chapter 11, and that these different nations would come against him to the time of the end, but then he would be broken and destroyed. Zechariah the prophet, as we learned last week, let us know that this false Messiah, this false Christ, would be an idol shepherd, a shepherd who brings his own idols, so to speak, 
but he also would suffer some sort of attack against him where he lost the use of one of his arms and his right eye is damaged. And so we were warned of this. And of course, Jesus himself telling us that in Matthew 24, this individual would set up an abomination that makes desolate. And when you see that in the holy place, remember what Daniel told us, Jesus said. Then you want to get out of Jerusalem. Well, those things are going to be starting to be unveiled for us today in our chapter. And of course, Paul writing to the Thessalonians said, listen, there will be this coming false Christ. There will be a falling away. Then he'll be revealed. And right now he's being kept back. But that which is restraining or keeping him back will be eventually removed. And then will come that lying one with all lying signs and wonders and deceptions. And he's going to deceive those who would not receive the love of the truth, the gospel of Jesus Christ, that they might be saved. And so those are the things that we were looking at last week. We were looking at the idea that what Revelation is giving to us through John, if you know your Bible, is not a surprise. It's simply just a further unveiling of what we're going to see in the last days as God is aligning the nations ultimately for judgment. So that was the historic look at, in a sense, the Antichrist. So today we need to look at it from a sense of the present, because we are seeing things happening here in the present that are most definitely beginning to lend or to lean toward this idea of the reorganizing of nations, the shifting of power, and a rise of a very deceptive, very powerful, satanically driven governmental system that is going to oppress the earth. That's what's coming based on prophecy sometime soon. And so knowing these things are coming our way, we are to be wise and to discern the signs of the times. Jesus told us to watch and pray. So here we have again this chapter, I stood upon the sand of the sea. Again from Daniel 7, it is, or Daniel, yeah, Daniel 7, the Mediterranean. And I saw a beast rise out of the sea. Again, we saw this last week, having seven heads. In chapter 17, we're going to get more detail about this Antichrist system. And in chapter 17, verses 9 and 10, we are told those seven heads are seven hills. Rome is the city that sits on seven hills. This will be defined further as we go through and identified, but just giving you that for now. Then again, there are ten horns, which again correspond to Nebuchadnezzar's dream of the ten toes. And in chapter 10, inter or sorry, in chapter 17, interestingly enough, we learn not only are there ten kings, but we learn this specific fact in chapter 17, verse 12. The ten horns which you saw are ten kings, which have received no kingdom as yet, but received power as kings one hour. Now, compared to the rest of human history, how long is one hour? Not too much. So a very short period of time, there are going to be 10 kings that suddenly rise up, or 10 rulers, or 10 presidents, or 10 prime ministers, or whatever they call them. But power will be consolidated to these 10 who rise up one hour with the beast. And what Daniel told us is these 10 kings would show up first, and then after them would come another little horn who would take three of them down and put his own power base together. So we will see at some point the world shifting to 10 major power or powers that seek to run this earth. You know, you might say to yourself, well, you know, as long as the United States is around, that's never gonna happen. That's an interesting statement. So in the news, because we want to look at the present. Now, let's look at the situation first. Then we'll look at the present. Let's do that. Good. Thank you, Teshi. Second Timothy. Second Timothy, chapter 3. What will the times be like when we should see these things begin to unfold? Well, we were warned. Paul, writing to Timothy, his last epistle before he will die for his faith, warned him. And he said this. He said, this know also that in the last days Perilous times shall come. Here are the hallmarks of the last days. Men shall be lovers of their own selves. I know that sounds far-fetched. It's hard to imagine, you know, you, all you ever hear is how humble people are on social media. Not that I'm on it. Or how uneventful their lives are. Men shall be lovers of themselves. They'll have places like my, MySpace or Facebook. I know that's not around anymore. Or Facebook. I know it's only for old people now. Or all the other things. But these different platforms where everybody can know about me or them. 
Men should be lovers of their own selves, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers. I know this is all far-fetched, but disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, without natural affection. The word is astorgos. Storgos is family affection. Families will fall apart. Without natural affection. Truce breakers, can't trust them. False accusers, incontinent. Now, before you get worried about it, the use of the word, there was no self-control over their appetites, not the current usage for a line of products. Fierce, despisers of those that are good, traitors, heady, high-minded, lovers of pleasures more than lovers of God. In fact, in these last days, you will find they have a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof. They may even be happy to attend church, but you see no change in their lives from the Holy Spirit. Form of godliness, but denying the power thereof. From such, turn away. In fact, the warning, for of this sort are they which creep into houses and lead captive silly women, laden with sins, led away with, led away with diverse lusts. You know, those desperate housewives and sex in the city and cougars and all the other things that are out there today. These things will be there, which is all part of family affection falling apart. And then I think the verse that epitomizes this generation, verse 7, ever learning, they can Google, they can ask Siri, they can ask Alexa, they can ask whatever Google's put out. Ever learning. They can learn all kinds of facts, details, statistics. Sadly yet, never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. If there's ever a generation that's learning more than any other before, it's this one. And yet, sadly, many never coming to the knowledge of the truth. Well, he goes on warning about Genesis and Jambres withstanding Moses and all that. But he gave us the encouragement in verse 12. Yea. And all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. Now, I know that's a memory verse for you, too. But it's a challenge. But in the last days, evil men and seducers shall wax worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. But continue thou, Timothy, as well as us, in the things which thou hast learned and has been assured of, knowing of whom thou hast learned them, and that from a child, Timothy, you have known the holy scriptures, which are able to make you wise unto salvation. How? Through faith, which is in Christ Jesus. That's how we come to Christ, through faith in him, learning it from his word. Interesting as well, John writing to us, if you would, 1 John chapter 2. 1 John chapter 2, verse 18. John, writing to the church, warned them and said, Little children, it is the last time. And as you have heard, that Antichrist shall come, as we've covered extensively. Even now there are many Antichrists, whereby we know it is the last time. They went out from us, but they were not of us, that is, of the church. For if they had been of us, they would no doubt have continued with us. But they went out that they might be made manifest that they are not all of us. But you, you and I who believe, you have an unction that is an anointing from the Holy One. And you know all things. I've not written unto you because you know not the truth, but because you know it, and that no lie is of the truth. Who is a liar but he that denieth that Jesus is the Messiah, or that is, is the Christ? He that denieth is Antichrist, he that denieth the Father and the Son. Whosoever denieth the Son, the same hath not the Father. But he that acknowledgeth the Son hath the Father also. Let that therefore abide in you which you have heard from the beginning. And if that which you have heard from the beginning shall remain in you, you shall also continue in the Son and in the Father. And this is the promise that he has promised us, us who believe, even eternal life. So in the backdrop of this rising Antichrist, before he emerges on the scene, we're going to see a time of great trouble. We're going to see a time of persecution, evil, evil men and seducers waxing worse and worse. More and more of those who are denying, in a sense, Christ or against Christ. And then it will all encapsulate into this rising world ruler. So we're looking for this one who has seven heads, ten horns, again, the structure of his power, Upon his horns, ten crowns. Now, the idea of ten major power brokers may sound fanciful to you until you look at the news. So now here's our current events. This first one coming from prophecywatch.com, June 1st. New global club of ten nations, precursor to the beast of revelation? Question mark. Here's what's going on behind the scenes in the world. 
The United Kingdom has proposed a plan to create a new club of democratic nations to address the reliance of the world on Chinese technology partners for 5G. That's a Wi-Fi phone technology for those who aren't aware. The COVID-19 crisis has revealed the dangers of relying on outside sources for infrastructure needs, but more importantly to many nations is the security risk associated with giving Chinese tech companies so much control over what many believe will be a new technology boom reaching every aspect of our lives. We'll unfold this idea more next week about the Chinese and technology. 5G technology would do much more than just give us faster download speeds and, lower laten and low latency. Though it's increased capacity and connectivity for billions of devices, especially in the areas of virtual reality, the Internet of Things, and artificial intelligence, it has the potential to create a network that can connect virtually everyone and everything together, including machines, objects, and devices. Uh, that would be Revelation 11 unfolding. Those countries who can create the infrastructure and roll it, out to a na roll it out nationwide first have the greatest potential to lead in many areas that will have global implications for decades to come. Such fears have led the US in recent months to take action against Huawei, China's first global tech brand and a maker of network equipment and smartphones. It is now prevented from doing business in the United States as it believes the company is being used by the Chinese leadership to serve the interest, their interest instead of the countries it is building it for. And I would add to that, you betcha they're using it. They want to hear everything we're doing. The UK also has launched an inquiry into Huawei's involvement in the country's mobile network upgrade in the wake of US sanctions against the company and has now promosed, proposed a far more reaching solution. Ready? The D10. The D10, I wonder if it stands for Daniel 10, just a thought. The D10 of democratic partners which would include the G7 countries, UK, which was part of the former Roman Empire, US, Italy, which by implication, part of the former Roman Empire, Germany, a little bit of it, part of the former Roman Empire, France, a little bit of that, part of the former Roman Empire, Japan and Canada, plus Australia, South Korea and India, would aim to create alternative suppliers of 5G equipment and other technologies to avoid relying on China. These 10 members represent more than 50% of the world's gross domestic product and would certainly have the economic power to make changes on a global scale. While it is unlikely at this point in time, should these 10 countries create a more permanent and long-lasting alliance Beyond the 5G issue, it would represent one of the most powerful economic alliances in the history of the world. The proposed Club of Nations demonstrates that when there is common cause, countries can come together in times of difficulty or crisis. The initial formation of the G7 came about in response to the economic crisis of the past. The current economic crisis caused by COVID-19 could certainly still result in some global alliances as the world looks to unify its response and policies to deal with a crisis that is far from over. This is written in June 1. Why should any of, the of any of this matter to the Christian? Beyond the current geopolitical and technological implications, there's a pattern developing here that is worth noting in terms of biblical context that gives us a foreshadowing of things yet to come. The book of Revelation, how many have heard of it? Two of you. Book of Revelation in the New Testament and the book of Daniel in the Old Testament detail a final alliance of nations that will consist of 10 kings or 10 nations, some of which many prophecy experts believe will include portions of what used to be the Roman Empire. It is out of this 10 kingdom alliance that the Antichrist comes to power and begins his reign that is elaborated upon in detail in the book of Revelation. Interestingly enough, Revelation describes how the kings of the East, perhaps China, will trouble this global leader and that he eventually marches upon the Middle East for a final conflict where they will meet, resulting in what is often referred to as Armageddon and climaxes with Christ's second coming. While this current conflict over 5G technology may seem like a far cry from the descriptions in Revelation, it still serves as a reminder as how quickly our world can change 
and how our history can often build upon previous actions, similar to how World War II was built upon the foundations of World War I. Precedent-setting events such as this new D-10 alliance can create patterns for the future, and we should be paying attention, or at the very least, be reminded to understand what our Bible does, what our Bible teaches, does teach us in regard to last things. Who are the nations involved? What is the timeline? What technologies does the Bible describe being used at this time in history? What is the role of Israel? Does Trump's peace plan fit the prophecy of Daniel 9:27? We should not be caught unaware of the importance of world developments in relationship to Bible prophecy. However, such a study of these topics requires a commitment of time to explore these important issues. And so I'll add, so just keep coming each week and we'll do our best to work through it. Now, you might say, well, that's a Christian prophecy site. I mean, come on, they're always talking about stuff like that. Okay, fine, second article, New York Post, June 1st, 2020. Trump postpones G7 meeting and seeks to expand membership. Air Force One, President Donald Trump said Saturday that, June 1st, that he will postpone until the fall a meeting of the group of seven nations he had planned to hold next month at the White House, despite the ongoing coronavirus pandemic. And he said he plans to invite Russia, Australia, South Korea, and India, as again he indicated the group's expansion. Now that would make it a G11, but let's keep reading. Trump told the reporters on Air Force One as he returned to Washington from Florida that he feels the current makeup of the group is very outdated and doesn't properly represent what's, quote, going on in the world, unquote. He said he had not yet set a new date for the meeting, but thought the gathering could take place in September, around the time of the annual meeting of the United Nations in New York, or perhaps after the U.S. elections in November. Alyssa Farah, <clears throat> White House Director of Strategic Communications, said that Trump wanted to bring in some of the country's traditional allies and those impacted by the coronavirus to discuss the future of China. The surprise announcement came after Germany, Ch German Chancellor Angela Merkel, whose office said on Saturday that she would not be attending the meeting unless the course of the coronavirus had spread, had changed by then, or the spread had changed by then, further down. The G7 members are Canada, France, again, part of the Roman Empire, Germany, part of the Roman Empire, Italy, parts of it, part of the Roman Empire, Japan and the United Kingdom, and the United States. The group's presidency rotates annually among member countries. Trump has repeatedly advocated for expanding the group to include Russia, prompting opposition from some members, including Canada's Justin Trudeau, who told reporters he had privately aired his objection to Russian admittance. Russia, quote, has yet to change the behavior that led to its expulsion in 2014 and therefore it should not be allowed back into the G7, unquote, he said at a news conference, which would then leave Australia, South Korea, and India, which would equal 10. The House has also passed a bipartisan resolution in December 2019 that supports Russia's previous expulsion from the annual gathering. Russia has been invited to attend the gathering of the world's most advanced economy since 1997, but was suspended in 2014 following its invasion of Ukraine and the annexation of Crimea. So here, the world is looking at ways to expand and to consolidate to 10. Okay, 10 horns upon his head, 10 crowns upon his horns, and the names of blasphemy, Revelation 13:2. And so the beast which I saw, again, had remnants of these former empires, like unto a leopard, Greece. His feet were as the feet of a bear, Medo-Persia. His mouth is the mouth of a dragon, Babylon. We'll see more of that in chapter 17. And the dragon gave him his authority, as the idea, power, and his thronos, seat or throne, and great authority. We talked about it last week when Jesus was tempted. And I saw one of his heads, as it were, sphazo is the word, to slay or to kill, wounded, to death, that's thanatos, death. I saw one of his heads as if it were wounded to death. What did Zechariah tell us? One of his arms will be lost, and one of his eyes will no longer function. There is going to be a, an attempt to destroy this world leader. Now, when is this all going to happen? I'll give you an opinion, which is worth a bag of beans at Walmart. The opinion is this. We will see this rising Antichrist confirm a covenant. Now, whether or not the church is here, there's lots of arguments. I think perhaps we will be gone, but you never know. We might see him ink it and then go. I don't know. When I look at the word, I see the church worshiping Jesus. Then the scroll is taken. Then the first seal is broken. Then the Antichrist rises. But that doesn't mean we won't see some trouble before we get there. 
So this rising world leader makes a covenant. It would seem that shortly after making that covenant, an attempt is made against his life that wounds his white, white, white eye, Mr. Wabbit, right eye and his arm, and perhaps even kills him. Well, how can you say kills him? I know it's a long time ago, but you remember chapter 11, the two prophets? I'm going to remember that. We went through it. It told us when the two prophets have finished their testimony, which was three and a half years, the beast that shall ascend out of the bottomless pit shall make war against them, overcome them, and kill them. This was the Antichrist. So he comes out of the bottomless pit. The question comes up, how did he get into the bottomless pit? What would be an answer? If an attempt was made against his life and he had actually, for example, died. Wait, Pastor Chris, Pastor Chris, are you saying that this guy's gonna, there's going to be a resurrection? We need to declare those terms. In the Old Testament, how many heard of Elijah? He raised someone from the dead. How many heard of Elisha? He raised someone from the dead. How many have heard of Paul the Apostle? God used him to raise someone from the dead. How about Peter? God used him to raise someone from the dead. Of course, the Lord himself, raising Lazarus and many others and others. To be raised from the dead, all those that we see in the Old Testament and even in Jesus' ministry raised from the dead would eventually die again. To be resurrected is to be raised from the dead never to die again. There's a difference. We may well see not only an assassination attempt against what is this Antichrist, he may actually die from this thing and be raised from the dead, which would be the ultimate counterfeit Christ. When will we know for sure? When it's history. But this idea that he comes out of the bottomless pit, mentioned again to us in chapter 17, and the fact that he dies or he suffers a mortal wound to Thanatos' death, and his deadly wound was healed, this seems to be the very thing that is used to completely deceive the nations. What is either a pseudo-resurrection, or a pseudo, sorry, raising from the dead, or a genuine raising from the dead, whether it's really happened or it's only pseudo-happened, the fact is it's going to look like this thing is legit, and it is going to deceive many. And so that's what we're looking for in present and future. He will suffer a devastating attack. One of his heads, verse 3, will be wounded as to death. The deadly wound will be healed, and all the world will wonder after the beast. This is all part of the setup. And here's where it takes them, verse 4. And they worship the dragon, <clears throat> that is Satan from chapter 12, the devil, which gave power unto this Antichrist beast. And they worship the beast, saying, Who is like unto the beast? Who's able to make war with him? He's defeated these two prophets. He's had what looks like a pseudo or a genuine raising from the dead. He seems absolutely unstoppable, and the world flocks to him to worship. There was given him a mouth speaking, as we learned in Daniel 7, as we learned in Daniel 11, a mouth speaking great things and blasphemies. Power was given to him to continue for 42 months. The last three and a half years before that rock cut without human hands lands on the world governments and establishes the kingdom of God. And he opened his mouth in blasphemy, verse 6, against God, to blaspheme his name. Now, there's more than just a name in that translation of the word. You know, the old statement, what's in a name? It not only means name, it means character, title, or perhaps even reputation. He blasphemes the very character of God. I know that sounds crazy that people would actually slander God's character, God's name, and even just his reputation. He slanders all these things and his tabernacle, and them that dwell in heaven. And it was given unto him to make war with the saints, those who believe living on the earth, and to overcome them. And power was given him over all kindreds, tongues, and nations. Wait a second. Who is the current superpower of this earth? You don't have to come on. Who, what country? This one. If you look at militarily, aircraft carriers, you know, planes, technology, radar, those are just the declassified. We're really head and shoulders above. In the last three years, this administration has made sure that we get some things that were perhaps stalled for eight years to put us even further above. You can't have this thing unfold unless something happens to the United States which is something, if you've been coming for a long time with us and been through the book before, we've talked about why is it we don't see the United States stepping in and shutting it down? 
In fact, we can even go back to the Old Testament and think about in the book of Ezekiel. In chapter 36, Israel will rebloom. It will again have trees, flowers, plants. These things will be exported around the world. And <clears throat> those things since 1948 and really since the late 1890s have come to pass. They planted 57 million trees. They export fruit. They export flowers. And it's absolutely stunning what they've done for, for this wasteland in the north and in the south desert to where they've bloomed. Ezekiel 36 has, has happened in front of our eyes in this last 70 years. Then comes Ezekiel 37, and that is Jews from all over the world will suddenly, in a sense, wake up and come home. And that started in the late 1800s with the World Zionist Congress and coming back and beginning to buy swampland from the Arabs. But then after World War II, the Holocaust and the tragedy that happened throughout Europe, Jews in mass began to return to Israel, immediately suffering when they declared themselves a nation, attack, a war to try and destroy them. The next day, after they declared independence, God got them through it, and they've been through the Yom Kippur War in 67 and other battles. But they're back. And they're coming back even now because of the anti-Semitism in Europe and COVID-19. They're still coming back. They go into quarantine, but they're still coming back. They've come from Argentina, Ethiopia, Russia, Ukraine, all over the world. But then comes Ezekiel 38 and 39. And that is where Persia, known to us as Iran, Russia, perhaps Ukraine, Turkey, Libya, Sudan or Ethiopia, North Africa, suddenly come after Israel and invade them, or tried to invade them. Ezekiel 38 and 39. Wednesday night, when we were going through Micah, I read to the church an article about how there were, by that point, six explosions that have happened in the last three, four weeks in Iran. I believe now seven and eight have occurred since Wednesday night. Things are blowing up in Iran. And of course, they're in factories, <clears throat> the Iranians claim. But what we know they're in are their nuclear research projects, their missile assembling factories, their centrifuges, and all the other things they're doing. These things are suddenly starting to blow up repeatedly. And if you haven't seen it, look up things blowing up in Iran. Just look it up. It's in the news. But there are things blowing up repeatedly. Some have been bombs that have been planted in the facilities. Others have just suddenly blown up out of nowhere. And it's really interesting because if you were watching last year, December, January, you know, uh, Israel received F-35 stealth planes. And now things are blowing up in Iran and blowing up again in Iran and blowing up again in Iran. So the question is, how long till Iran finally says, that's it? We're going to come in. Best defense is a good what? Offense. When this battle of Ezekiel 38 and 39 happened, which could break out honestly at any time, no one stops it. It talks about the young lion saying, have you come to take a spoil? Some figure that is Britain, Australia, and perhaps the United States. They don't try to stop it. And the question has always come up, why? Three major suggestions for why the United States would sit this one out being such a close ally. One, a major change in administration that is now anti-Israel and refuses to help them. I know that sounds far-fetched, but it could happen in November. Two, the United States, for example, thanks to the trillions that we've printed, were to suddenly implode economically. And having lived through the collapse of the ruble, after the Soviet Union imploded and watched people go through 2,000% hyperinflation, they couldn't fly planes, they couldn't launch boats, they could barely feed their soldiers. They were ground to a halt. Now, I know a lot of weapons just turn the key and off it goes, but it broke them. Some argue perhaps we're broken economically. A third one, which everybody likes to hear, but we have to wait and see, if God suddenly removed his church, it would bring upheaval to this country. But the fact is, we have a battle coming soon to the Middle East, and yet the United States sits it out. And then we have a rise of an Antichrist, and he is unopposed. He has trouble from the north, trouble from the south, and trouble from the kings of the east. But we don't hear about the west. Which means more than ever, we need to be praying for our country, because we don't know what's coming, but something's going to shift the balance of power, and it's going to allow this person to rise and essentially create this region that is completely under his control in some fashion. It will be given to him, verse 7, to make war with the saints, to overcome them. And this again, those during this tribulation. Power, again, authority is given to him over all kindreds, tongues, and nations. No one seems to stand up to him, at least for a period of time. 
and all that dwell upon the earth. Again, that term used 11 times in this book. This is our sixth, speaking of the unbeliever. They that dwell upon the earth shall worship him whose names are not written in the book of life of the lamb slain from the foundation of the world. If any man has an ear, let him hear. And that's about how far we got last week. You better hurry up or you're not going to get any further. Notice, please, the lamb slain from the foundation of the world. Adam and Eve's disobedience, deception, disobedience, and fall was not a surprise to God. Well, then... Why did he make them? I mean, look at all the mess that's going on. For God to have a relationship with not only the angelic realm, but also the human realm, if they don't have the ability to choose, it's not a relationship. It's a one-way street. And so the angelic realm, we've talked about what happened back in Revelation 12. The human realm, we know what happened from Genesis chapter 3 when Adam and Eve fell. The fact is God knew these things would happen. And so before the foundation of the world, he had actually put in place in the counsel of God man's redemption the Son of God coming and taking our sins. In fact, you can see it. I'll just read it to you. But in Ephesians chapter 1, we get this very interesting statement. It says to us in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 4. Let's go to verse 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with all spiritual blessings and heavenly places in Christ, according as he hath chosen us in him, Christ, before the foundation of the world. Before he ever said, let there be light, he knew this would happen. And he'd already put in motion the plan of redemption. Before your parents, your grandparents, your grandparents, your great-granddad, or anybody else was formed, he knew you needed to be redeemed. Before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy without blemish, or holy without blame before him in love, having predestinated us unto the adoption of children by Jesus Christ to himself, according to the good pleasure of his will. Before these things ever happened, he knew it would happen. If you're here today and you're listening or you're tuning in live stream, you're stuck in the living room waiting to get back to Roku or whatever it may be, the fact that you're listening is part of the idea that before the foundation of the world, God ordained you would be sitting where you are now in your car on the radio or in the home because someone took the TV or perhaps even outside today listening from Dairy Queen. We've had a few. God's trying to call you. And there's some seriously bad things coming to the earth and you want to receive the Lord while you can. So the admonition, if any man has an ear, let him hear. Now, verse 10, he that leadeth into captivity shall go into captivity. He that killeth with the sword must be killed with the sword. Here is the patience, the bearing up underneath, hupomon. Here is the patience and the faith of the saints. What do you mean? What this world has sown, know this, it is going to surely what? Reap. For us, what we sow for the kingdom of God, we will reap. For the world, what they've sown, God is going to cause them to reap in his judgment. God will one day make all things right, and the judgment and the retribution against these things will be just. But now we get to our text, verse 11. And I beheld another beast, oh boy, coming up out of the earth, which seems to indicate of men or out of, country, out of a country, as opposed to out of the nations or the sea, but again... Another beast coming up out of the earth, and he had two horns like a lamb. Oh, good. <laughs> He's peaceful. Keep reading. And he spake as a dragon, satanically empowered. Interesting in this description, and this is all we get of him, basically. No crown, because he's not directly political, yet he influences politics. No weaponry, because he's not military, military in a sense, yet he's going to influence the battles that are going to occur. His influence essentially seems to be spiritual. What we have rising is what is often described as the false prophet. And this false prophet, as you'll see for three and a half years with the Antichrist breaking out and declaring himself to be God, this false prophet affirms the message of this Antichrist that he is indeed the Christ that people ought to worship. And when they turn to the Antichrist, he brings them to the feet of Satan. Now, I'm going to point out something obvious. We have the devil, we have the Antichrist, and we have a false prophet, which leaves me with how many fingers up? Three. Which is a counterfeit father, Satan taking that position, a counterfeit son, a false Christ, a counterfeit Holy Spirit. When Satan puts out his final deception, he does it in three persons. The devil himself, the Antichrist, empowered by him, 
and the false prophet. Where there is a counterfeit, there must always be a genuine. Don't miss this. He puts a false trinity out. So I beheld another beast coming out of the earth, and it had two horns like a lamb, it spake as a dragon. And he exerciseth all the power of the first beast, the Antichrist, before him. And he causes the earth and them that dwell therein, the uh, what seventh use of this term of the unbelievers. And he causes the earth and them that dwell therein to worship the first beast, the Antichrist. Note this again, epic event, whose deadly wound to slay or to kill, deadly wound was healed. And this false prophet, he doeth great wonders, so that he maketh fire come down from heaven on the earth in the sight of men. And he deceiveth them, here's our eighth use of that term, he deceiveth them that dwell on the earth by the means of those miracles which he had power to do in the sight of the beast. So here comes this false, this false prophet, and he does supernatural things to bring people to the feet of this false Christ so that he even makes fire come down from heaven. How many heard of Moses? Two of you. How many are still awake? Three of you. We'll take it. Moses and Aaron, when they dedicated the tabernacle, the tent, put everything in order, went into the tabernacle, came out. When they came out, the fire of God came down, consumed the sacrifice on the altar. The people fell on their faces and said, the Lord, he is God. The Lord, he is God. They were blown away by the manifestation of God's fire from heaven devouring that sacrifice. Solomon, when he dedicated the first temple, spread forth his hands to heaven. Amazing prayer that he had about hearing from heaven and forgiving those who had sinned against God or found themselves taken away by their sin, and they finally turned back. And after his prayer, the fire came down from God and consumed again the sacrifice on the altar, and the people again blown away by the presence of God, worshiping, falling on their faces. I mean, you've heard of Elijah. Elijah the prophet faces the prophets of Baal or Baal on Mount Carmel. They set up two different sacrifices. The prophets of Baal get to go first. They spend the whole day, cut up the ox, put it all on, set the whole thing in order, crying out to their false god who never answers with fire. The challenge was whoever's really God will answer with fire. And then at the time of the evening sacrifice, Elijah put the 12 stones in place, put the sacrifice on, poured water on it three times, dug a trench to keep the water there, and then said, Lord, hear me that they may know that you're turning your heart, their hearts back to you. Hear me. And fire came down and consumed the sacrifice, the water, the wood, the rocks, and the dust. And the people fell on their faces and said, the Lord is God, the Lord is God. Elijah, 2 Kings chapter 1. When Ahaziah was sick and not sure he was going to make it, sends an entourage. And they go basically to capture Elijah. 50, a captain of 50 with his 50. You man of God, come down. The king wants to talk to you. And Elijah said, hey, if I'm a man of God, let fire come down from heaven, consume you and your 50. Boom, they were gone. So they sent another captain of 50 and 50. You man of God, if I'm a man of God, let fire, boom, they were gone. They sent a third captain of 50 with his 50. He came up, kind of crawled up, bowed down before him, said, hey, man, we all have families. Can you help us out? Would you? I mean, the king wants to see you. Would, you. would you come with us? And the spirit said to Elijah, go with him. You'll be fine. So if you know your Bible, and then we have in Revelation 11, those two prophets, what were the things they could do? They could turn water to blood and they could, what to their enemies? Call fire down upon them. Fire proceeds out of their mouth, they call it down. If you know your Bible, or at least you know part of it, and you're not careful, you would think every time you see fire from heaven, it is from God. But there's one place it's not. And that's in Job chapter 1, when Satan asked to attack Job, and God said, okay, you can touch his things, but you cannot touch him. Chapter 1, Satan went out, and one of the things that happened is his herdsmen came and said, the fire came down from God and consumed and destroyed all your sheep. Who was behind that action? Satan. So all the other times fire comes down from heaven, it's the true and living God making his presence known through his servants. But in the one case in Job chapter 1, it's Satan. So here when he says, listen, he does great wonders so that he maketh fire come down from heaven on the earth in the sight of men. If you don't know the whole counsel of the word of God, you might quickly see and think it's genuine. And he deceives those who dwell on the earth. Jesus said to us in Matthew 24, which gives us an important point. 
He said to us in Matthew 24, when you see the abomination of desolation, stand in the holy place. Again, 24:15. he said, let the reader understand that which was spoken by Daniel the prophet. And he warned us, get out of town. And he said to us that there's going to be great tribulation in verse 28, these last three and a half years, such as was not since the beginning of the world to this time, nor ever shall be. And then he said in chapter 24, verse 22, and except those days should be shortened, no flesh should be saved, but for the elect's sake, those days shall be shortened. Now, sometimes when people read through this, they say, well, the elect, it's got to be the church. Therefore, the church is going through this time out. Were the people elect by God to salvation before the church? Well, how many read Hebrews 11? Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Rahab, Noah. Are there people elect to salvation in the church? Absolutely. Are there people elect to salvation after the church is removed? Absolutely. We call them tribulation saints, and we're going to meet all of them in Revelation 20. There are a group of people on the earth during this time of judgment that will survive it. Having faith in Christ, when he returns, Matthew 25, he's going to sit on his throne. He's going to divide sheep from goats. And the sheep get to enter into his kingdom that he does on the throne of David for a thousand years when that rock cut without human hands sets up his kingdom. They have to survive and enter that kingdom. We'll get into it in the rest of the book of Revelation. So he warned us. They're going to arise false Christ, false prophets. They're going to show great signs and wonders insomuch that if it were possible, they should deceive the very elect. Behold, I have told you these things before. These things are coming. So this false prophet doeth great wonders so that he maketh fire come down from heaven on the earth in the sight of men. Revelation 13, 14. And he deceiveth them that dwell on the earth. Again, term of the unbelievers, atheus by the means of those miracles which he had power to do in the sight of the beast, and saying to them that dwell on the earth that they should make an image, as Jesus warned, as Daniel warned, and as this book warns. They should make an image to the beast, which had the wound, there it is again, by a sword, and did live. And this false prophet had power to give life. That's not zoe, life, motion, life, animated life. The word, the word here is pneuma, spirit, some sort of intelligence or presence. Had power to give life unto the image of the beast. Well, Pastor Chris, Pastor Chris, I've been to Sight and Sound. Yeah, it's great, isn't it? Yeah, I've seen the animatronics. I mean, what's the big deal? Okay. Or I've been to Disney. I've seen the animatronics. Okay. Or I've been to the zoo. I've seen the animatronics. Okay. This is something beyond that. This is something supernatural. He had power to give life unto the image of the beast, that the image of the beast should both speak and cause as many as would not worship the image of the beast, that they should be killed. And the word is apostorio, that is to be killed outright or suddenly put to death. And then we learn he causes all, small and great, rich or poor, free or bond, to receive a mark in the right hand or in their foreheads. And you cannot buy or sell except you have this mark. Well, there's no way we're going to cover this in the time we have left. So we're going to hit this next week. And for those who are sneaking in, you will probably be happy to sneak in because there's going to be some slides and some video. There's already rolled out in a country a system that figures out how well you are a citizen, how well you behave. And if you don't behave well, you are denied train tickets, plane tickets, travel, and promotions. There's already something like this being used. Question is how long till everybody's stuck with it. But we're out of time. Let's stand. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the reminder, Lord, these things are going to come. Thank you that we don't have to be caught unaware. We see, Lord, what's going on in the nations around us, Lord. This, this virus has, in many ways, united and divided. Lord, we see many, perhaps some listening today, their lives are never going to be the same because of the financial damage that has come from this virus or perhaps the response to the virus, not just in this country but around the world. And suddenly, Lord, we find ourselves quite the global community Lord, we pray for our country because, Lord, as we look through your word, we don't see it. We don't see it being the bulwark or the backstop against evil. 
And so, Lord, we wonder how long until these things are shaken. We ask that we would shine brightly for you. Our hope is in you and not in Washington, D.C. And we pray, Father God, you would strengthen each of your people that we might be able to stand even in the evil day and bring forth light where there is so much darkness. So, Lord, bless your church with a fresh filling of your Holy Spirit. And Lord, if these things begin to unfold quickly, give us the boldness to let people know this isn't, this isn't a surprise, but better to come to Christ while they can. Thank you for this day. Thank you for your word. And Lord, it'll be clear when it's history. But Lord, I pray these things would be right for your church to help them walk through this time in Jesus' name. Amen.